Hi, and welcome to the InterAxis YouTube channel and InterAxis.io. Uh, today we're going to keep moving forward with this talk of insurance and hedging and, and uh, I guess what we, we referred to in a previous video as risk management. Um, and in this video I'm going to mainly focus on insurance and what's happening in the decentralized world to uh, kind of coincide with what has happened in the past in the traditional financial world. So if you remember in, the, in a previous video, I talked about insurance as a form of risk management. Uh, it happens in the personal side, right? And on the, on the personal side from an insurance perspective, I know that I have this uh, financial plan going forward that I'm going to earn a salary. I'm gonna save that for my retirement okay and hopefully my my wealth goes up up and up and up like this but of course if i die at some point in here and there's no more me then the salary stops coming in so how do i replace that i buy you know potentially life insurance to replace that and and my family now continues to get this wealth that's a part of risk management and and that's a way i've insured i've transferred that risk to an insurance company um, where that works uh in in the in the, the com in the world of commerce, in the world of business, insurance is, is so big because what, what you really want to look at is what are the risks that, that whatever business I'm undertaking is not going to succeed? What are the risks that either my revenue will fall or my expenses will rise because of some particular event? And if that event is something concrete, something that I can measure and see, then I can probably find a way to either insure it or hedge against it. In the form of insurance, again, I'm transferring risk. So where does that work? Let, let's say that um, a, a bank uh, has, has loaned me money. A bank has given me a, a loan for my business. Now the bank uh, has, has underwritten me, right? They've looked at all the, the factors that might go into whether or not I can repay that loan. They might have taken some collateral and, and so on. But then the bank undergoes some sort of risk management, right? And they might go, okay, what, what can happen to the business or to Adam that might cause us to not get repaid on that loan, that might cause his revenue to go down or his expenses to go up sufficiently that he doesn't have the profit to pay us back? And uh, let's say I, I'm a farmer, so the bank might go out and take out some sort of insurance uh, against my crops failing or something. Um, if, if I'm in the energy business, they might go take out some uh, some insurance or they might hedge against oil prices or something. So it happens in the, in the world of, of industry, commerce, um, just business. That there's a lot of insurance going on because the bank is in the business of lending money. They are not in the business of speculating on crops or speculating on my business or speculating on oil prices or real estate prices. Okay, they are in the business of lending me money and getting their interest for lending me that money. They're not in the business of collecting my collateral. That's not what they want to do. So they want to transfer their risk or hedge their risk on all these other factors so that they can just make money on the interest. All right. Now, how does that translate in the decentralized world? Right? What's happening? Now, if we go back to the idea of insurance, if you remember, originally insurance was, was, was what is called a mutual. Mutual meant that everybody was, was putting money into this pool right for mutual interest because it was better for us if uh, if we in the village all put some money in here and if one of us dies that money goes to the survivors there or the the surviving family of that person who died because it was the best in in the best interest of the community the same thing happened in in pools of commerce right if if different um, companies were shipping different goods they might pool their interest so that they can insure each other against uh, losing goods due to, uh, due to fire or theft or piracy or weather or something else because no one knows when it's their turn to lose their goods. So they all help each other so that no one has to self-insure. No one has to keep a bunch of cash on hand or a bunch of goods on hand or no one has the risk of potentially going out of business because of one event that happened. So insurance was necessarily mutual. Um, the, then what, what happened was commerce became big. The, the, the community got bigger, 
right? The community got to be worldwide, and it got to be very difficult for these people to, to keep track and insure. So you had to have a central party, right? So this was called the insurance company. And the insurance company's job is to look at all these risks and all these potential players and evaluate. And they have what's called actuaries. And actuaries are evaluating the risk. What are the chances? What are the odds? What, what, what are the chances that some certain bad event can happen and cause one or more of, of these insureds to need this benefit? Okay, and, and once they do that, they calculate the premium. How much do we need to, to, to collect in insurance premiums from each one of these parties in order to make our numbers work, in order to make it to where if there is some sort of claim that we still make money as the insurance company. And so they, they, do, they go through what's called underwriting. And the insurance companies have become very, you know, very large. They, they've become good at doing this, and they're, they've been performing something that is completely necessary in the financial world, which is the transfer of risk. We're transferring risk to each other. We're transferring it to the in insurance company. Now, are there still uh, mutual companies? Yes, there, there are several mutual companies, and you've probably heard of all of them. Uh, here, you know, mainly in the, in the United States, there are companies like Mass Mutual, Northwestern Mutual, New York Life, Liberty Mutual, uh, nationwide. Those are all mutual companies. They are not public companies. You can't buy stock in them. They are owned by the policy holders. Okay, so the insurance company, the, the mutual insurance company exists here in the middle. So you have all these policy holders putting money in. The mutual company's job is to underwrite it's to make sure that, that they're following their actuarial tables, that they're not bringing in uh, less money than they're sending out from a, a risk perspective. And if it starts to get that way, they have to adjust premiums, they have to adjust products and such. Now, the mutual companies have also gotten big in that they also they have to spend money on uh, marketing, on, on buildings, on people, on all those other things, and, and they've gotten to be big. And sometimes they stop being mutual and they go public, meaning now they're owned by shareholders and they're solely in business to collect more in premiums than they give out in benefit. That, that's, that's their only business. They're not necessarily in business to be owned. It's not the policy holders owning the company, it's the public owning the company. And, and now the, the insurance company is beholden to their stockholders and no longer their policy holders. So, but there are still several mutual companies and they still operate very well, very efficiently, um, very profitably. So where are we now? Well, now the, the beauty in the decentralized world, as we've talked about, is, is you can create very customized and bespoke financial products and services, right? So if I'm, let's say, a, a, uh, a farmer in some, uh, we'll call it a, a farmer in, in Africa, okay, I might have a, a very, um, uh, you know, a, a small farm with some crops that I grow, and these are subject to things like uh, obviously the, the weather, the demand, um, some things that I really can't control, but I'm going to go um, grow my crops. Now this farmer might need uh, a loan, you know, it might help to get a loan. Well, if the farmer is, doesn't have access to a bank or is in a, is in a country where the, the government has, you know, completely devalued the currency, this farmer in the, the future might go get a D, you know, we'll call it a DeFi loan, right? The, this farmer might um, go onto one of the, the protocols or the platforms and say, I need a loan. And there might be people that go, look, I, I think your, your, your crops are great. I think there's going to be a demand. I'm going to lend you the money and you're going to, you know, pay me eight, nine, ten percent interest, but, you know, based on whatever my risk is and how much money I'm lending you. That's great. The farmer can now grow their crops. But the problem is if I'm lending this farmer money, I might want to get some sort of insurance uh, against those crops. But if, but if there aren't very many farmers in this area farming this particular crop, there might not be an insurance company that's willing, that, that, that has the ability to take on that risk because there's not enough farmers, there's not enough people providing the premiums, and it's not worth their time to underwrite it. 
enter the, the world of decentralized finance and decentralized insurance. Because now, maybe what we have in, in the future, and I'm not saying we're going to have this, but maybe what we have is the ability to create an insurance product specifically for the very few farmers that are, are growing these crops. And the reason we can do that is because we have data, right? So you can have data engineers and data scientists pull this data on, on the crops, on the demand, on the weather and such, and say, hey, what are the odds, what, what is the risk we have here of this farmer losing his crops or the demand going down or something happening with that, with that uh, country's leaders or something like that. We have enough data that maybe we can provide a good assessment of the risk here. The other thing we have is the ability, obviously, to transfer money, right? So we have the uh, potential of the cryptocurrency. The fact that we might not have to go through banks to do this. So we can, again, lower the fees and lower the friction as we try to create a very bespoke customized insurance product. And last but not least, we have something really important um, that's called the Oracle. Okay, and the Oracle is, is something I haven't really spoken about, but, it, but it's pretty important. And the Oracle in this case is what is, what is telling us that if I um, paid a premium for this insurance product, what is it that tells the insurance company or, or who, whoever is owning this insurance, what is it that tells them that I am due to get paid? Something bad happened, either the weather or the demand or whatever it is, what is that thing? And, and the problem has been in the past that maybe the, the oracles weren't good enough. Maybe we didn't have a significant enough or, or a sufficient oracle to tell us that this farmer lost X number of crops, okay? So now what we have is because of the, the rise of all this data, we have the ability to tie oracles to this. So some companies working on oracles are, there's a company called UMA, there's a company called Band Protocol. Okay, because what's happening is you're gonna have to take this insurance product and wrap it into a smart contract. And the smart contract is going to say, you know what, I'm going to erase all of this and show how this should really work, right? Because what you're going to have now is this smart contract insurance, right? And what it's going to say is I might pay a premium, some code there or, or protocol. Someone has developed on top of this protocol, this code that says here's a smart contract in insurance. I'm going to pay premium. Someone else is going to pay premiums and they've determined here, here's the premium you pay for X amount of benefit, right? Now, as this is going along, as these, the, in this case, the farmer is, is growing their crops and everything's fine, we just keep paying premiums and maybe the farmer's paying premiums. And it's being held in this smart contract, okay? These premiums are being paid via potentially cryptocurrency. It could be a stable coin, whatever it might be. Now, this is held on a blockchain, it's transparent, it's immutable, no, nothing can change this. As soon as this event happens, right, this major event, we'll call it, that triggers the payment of benefits, what has to happen is there has to be some oracle here that triggers the contract. And that oracle might be that uh, whether you know, the, the temperatures dip below a certain amount, uh, a certain temperature for a certain amount of time killing the crops, or there was some sort of measurement that said en enough crops didn't get grown, or there was some pest infestation, whatever it might be, some sort of oracle triggers this contract to pay benefits to the, the people who paid the premiums, the policyholders. So this is what we're seeing in, in potentially in insurance and, and with the, the rise of, of decentralized finance is one, you're going to need more of these bespoke insurance contracts, these customized insurance contracts because you have more customized lending and more customized financing available, more customized needs. But we're going to have that ability because of the protocols that are being built. So there's a company uh, called Nexus Mutual that's building this protocol. There's a company called EtherRisk 
it's building these types of insurance protocols, and then there's Oracle protocols like UMA, BAN protocol, and I, and I really apologize. I know there are others that are being built. I'm, I'm just not remembering them at the time. Um, but, but it's really interesting because now we're going to be, be able to create these customized insurance contracts so that I can still do business. I can potentially not necessarily be in the business of lending money, but I can have that as one of my investments where I lend money to some farmer somewhere. I lend money to someone halfway around the world that has some really good business that I like and I'm pretty certain I'm going to get paid, but now I have to go evaluate the risk. right? And I might be able to find one of these smart contracts, one of these insurance uh, contracts that someone has built on top of one of these protocols and say, oh, well now I can insure my risk. I feel comfortable making that loan and getting a really good interest rate because I'm able to insure that risk. And so that's what, what we are uh, potentially going to see in the world of decentralized finance and decentralized insurance. It's really interesting because as we increase the efficiency, as we increase the number of investment options and lending options and the number of people that can invest and lend, what we also do is we increase the risk. Well, these insurance contracts and these insurance protocols are giving us the ability to, potential, to, to potentially transfer that risk. Right now, they're being used primarily for things like cryptocurrency investments. I can, I can insure my, my wallet. I can insure my, the smart contract I make in a, in a lending protocol. But again, like with a lot of the other DeFi protocols, that's just testing the water. That's just those of us that are willing to, to go in early, testing these out, to, to make sure that they're, they're going to work and they can handle the pressure and the stress of, of potentially millions of users around the world hitting them all the time. We, we want to make sure that the underlying protocols, we want to make sure the, the base, the Ethereum or whatever blockchain we're using can handle the stress. And so some of us are taking it on right now. Nexus Mutual and EtherRisk are the, are the ones I know about. I know UMA and Band are really uh, doing a good job of trying to create and prove those oracles so that no one can be nefarious and write an insurance contract and then trick the oracle uh, into providing that benefit and hurting everyone that, that provided premiums. Um, but, but this is going to be something that's constantly in motion and we're going to learn how to use it. But what we're going to see is, again, more customized insurance contracts, people being able to build their own kind of insurance contract within a, a certain uh, either geographic region or industry or whatever it might be on insurance that they know is is really necessary um, and and create these these customized products which is a lot of what we're seeing in, in decentralized uh, finance in the decentralized world so again that that's a little bit about decentralized insurance I will probably go into more detail on Nexus Mutual and Ether Risk at some point. I'll go into definitely more detail on UMA and BAN protocol at some point. Um, but I want to talk about decentralized insurance and how we're transferring risk. Uh, again, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us at interaxis.io and on Twitter at interaxis8, the number eight. Uh, look forward to seeing you in more videos.